the Fourier transform is a central object in mathematics. It's funny, we actually had a good understanding of the Fourier transform before we had a good understanding of the real numbers that it's defined over. But when I say Fourier transform, if you are a mathematician, physicist, or engineer, you probably immediately think of the integral formula, um, this right here. And another thing that you probably think about is that of Planchet's theorem, which says that the L2 norm of a function or power of a signal in double e speak is preserved by the Fourier transform. That is the norm of the function is the same as the norm of its Fourier transform. This is all well and good until you ask something really stupidly fundamental. What is the Fourier transform of an L2 function? You probably are thinking, Joel, you're an idiot. You just put it on the screen right there. Well, that definition only really works if the function is integrable or in L1. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in the last video, but not every function in L2 is actually integrable or in L1. I mean, the easiest example to give you is 1 over 1 plus the absolute value of x. This function is not integral by the p-test that we learned in ordinary calculus, but it is square integrable, which means that the square of the function is integrable, which means that it is in L2. Okay, so it's not in L1, but why does this matter? Just ask what this Fourier transform would be of this function at omega equals 0. It's undefined, and this is since the integral is infinite. So what do we do? We need to come up with a new definition of the Fourier transform of L2 functions, and to do this, we're going to recruit a class of functions where the Fourier transform is very cleanly expressed. And these are Hermite functions. Hermite functions come up in all sorts of places in science and mathematics. They appear naturally in statistics and probability theory. They also diagonalize the quantum harmonic oscillator and quantum mechanics over L2. And important for us, they are the, an eigenbasis for the Fourier transform and are also L2 functions where they are orthogonal. We proved the orthogonality of the Hermite functions in a live stream a couple months ago. Man, that was a while ago. Uh, so today, I want to focus on their eigenfunction property with the Fourier transform. Using this, we're going to be able to give a new definition of the Fourier transform on L2 functions. Well, not new to the world, but new to the, the string of videos I'm putting together. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the board right now, and we're going to work out the Fourier... We're going to demonstrate that the... Fourier transform of Hermite functions are again Hermite functions times something else. That is, their eigenfunctions. And we're going to use a couple of things that we established before. We're going to use the generating function for Hermite polynomials, which can then be turned into a generating function for Hermite functions. And we're also going to use the fact that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is equal to a Gaussian. Now, to get the last bit of the diagonalization argument, we have to show that the eigenfunctions actually form a basis for L2. Now that's a little bit outside the scope of this particular video, but I'll do that in a live stream in a, probably a couple weeks. In any case, so let's go ahead and get into it, and uh, I'm just going to go up to the board and, and start recording, yeah, I guess. All right. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get this done. So we're going to need a couple of elements from previous videos, and so I have put them up here. I, in a live stream, I proved this generating formula for the Hermite polynomials. And you can actually use this as the straight definition of the Hermite polynomials, if you wish. Um, where you basically you just take uh, t equals zero here, and that'll give you your Hermite function at zero. And then you take the derivative and then take t equals zero then. And then you take second derivative and take t equals zero then. And each one of those will give you a different one of the Hermite functions, which is pretty heavy. We also proved the recursive definition of Hermite functions, which I have right here. And so you start with uh, h of 0 is equal to 1, h of 1 is equal to 2x, and then you can make each of the successive ones off of two previous ones just by combining them like this. So hn plus first Hermite polynomial is 2x times hn of x minus 2n of hn minus 1 of x. And so you can just generate them all that way if you wish. And you can use reuse this formula here to prove the generated function. Hermit functions are not Hermit polynomials, but they're Hermit polynomials times e to the minus x squared. So basically, if you take a polynomial and multiply it by e to the minus x squared, it is going to go to zero. And so these all fit inside of the Schwartz space, which is pretty nice. Now we're going to be applying the Fourier transform to our Hermit functions. So here uh, we are choosing just to have the minus i x w in here. And uh, we are you're going with the symmetric definition, sort of the mathematician's favorite, uh, the Fourier transform of 1 over the square root of 2 pi. That means that if you define the inverse Fourier transform, uh, you have the exact same coefficients. There's no nothing to really remember here. Uh, one Fourier transform that we're going to use is the Fourier transform of 
a Gaussian, it gives us a Gaussian back. And so it comes off with some little coefficients here and there, uh, but you know, it's nothing too bad. So now with all these things out of the way, we need to turn the, the generating function of the Herbie polynomials into the generating function of the Herbie functions. And that's really easy. We just need to multiply by this extra factor, e to the minus x squared over two. So basically we're gonna get our new generating function this way, uh, g x comma t of e to the minus x squared over two. And this is just gonna turn into n equals zero to infinity of h n times e to the minus x squared over two of t to the n over n factorial. And these are our Hermite functions, little h n of x, right? And so when we do this, we look at what happens here, and that's just gonna be e to the two x t minus t squared minus x squared over two. Now, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go ahead and apply the Fourier transform to this guy, uh, it says this is more or less a Gaussian, sort of shifted around a bit, is just gonna give us another Gaussian back. In fact, it's gonna turn out to be almost the exact same function, uh, but in, we removed x and we're gonna replace it with w, and uh, t is gonna be replaced with it. And then that's gonna give us our Hermite functions. So uh, let's go ahead and do that then. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the Fourier transform of this guy. So e to the 2xt minus t squared minus x squared over 2. And that is written this way. And let's say this is at w. And so as it written this way, so 1 over square root of 2 pi integral and minus infinity to infinity of e to the 2xt minus t squared minus x squared over 2. And this is times e to the minus i x w dw. Oh, dx, my bad. So that's what we have there. So what we're gonna notice immediately is that this integral is with respect to x and is not with respect to t. So we can take out at least one of these t's out of here. And then the rest of it, we're actually gonna to try to turn this into a single uh, squared term in here. And so we're gonna use completing the square and some of your usual calculus uh, or algebra tricks. So it's gonna be written as one over square root of two pi. And we're gonna take out this e to the minus t squared. So it's e to the minus t squared here. And this is gonna be times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, let's see, two, we're gonna have e to the minus x squared over two. And now we're gonna have plus two x t. And we have minus i x w dx. Now I'm gonna take an x out of here. So it's gonna leave us with 2t minus iw, this times x. Now, what we want to do is we ultimately want to complete the square, so we write this as a single square here. And uh, the complex number two don't really matter for us too much. It'll be the same formula we have in ordinary calculus. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take out this minus one half. I have an easier time seeing a lot of this stuff when I write it that way. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Always in math, you wanna make things as easy as possible as you can. And so I try to make things as blindly obvious to myself as I can here. So there we go. So when I factor out the minus one half, it took out, it changes a uh, plus sign we had here and took it out to pan and replace it with a minus. Now when we're doing completed square, what we're gonna do is we're going to go ahead and we're gonna take b over two and add square of that, which is what we do in ordinary algebra. So this is gonna be one over square root of two pi times e to the minus t squared and row with minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus one half. And now in here we have x squared minus two, two t minus i w, and then this times x. And now we're gonna add b over two squared. Well, we have a two here, so that two's gotta get canceled. And we're left with two t minus i w and that quantity squared. And of course, we're gonna have to subtract that as well and so when I subtract that, uh, we're going to pass through this minus sign here, and we're ultimately going to get this. We're going to have 2t minus i w, and then squared, and then we're going to have this over 2 hitting that as well. So I added a subtract inside the parentheses, and put it, then I moved one of these guys outside of the parentheses, and this is all done dx. Now, one thing that's really important to notice is that this extra piece I just left out here has nothing to do with x either. And so this can come out here and it can combine with this guy. And then we're left with this term in here, which is a perfect square. So let's go ahead and do those two steps at once. Something you should never do, but when you have a very small board, you kind of need to take two steps at a time sometimes. So we have e to the minus t squared. And now we're going to have plus 2t minus i 
w squared divided by 2, and we're left with this integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 1 half x minus 2t minus i w and this quantity squared dx. All right, so now what we can see is that if we take a look at this guy, this is more or less a Gaussian just shifted by 2t minus i w. t is constant, w is constant, or omega is constant if you want to say that. Um, this is a complex number, and so we're shifted to the complex plane, this whole integral. Um, an analytic argument can tell you that uh, that's not going to be any different than if I were to just take the integral from minus pi to pi of e to the minus one half times x squared. Okay, so then what we end up getting is this. We have one over square root of two pi times e to the minus t squared, and we're going to leave this guy alone for a minute, two t minus i w squared over two, and then times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared over 2. So what we can do is we can take this guy and we can go ahead and replace it with its value. The integral uh, from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared over 2 is square root of 2 pi as well. What that does is it cancels this guy, cancels that guy, and we're left with e to the minus t squared plus 2t minus i w squared over 2. All right, let's go ahead and simplify this. And so what we're left with is this guy. And so we have e to the minus t squared plus on the top here we have 4t squared minus 2t i w. And then we have plus i w squared, which is going to be minus w squared. Then we have minus t squared plus 2t. And so that is going to be e to the t squared. And now we're going to have minus 2it, oh, and the 2 gets canceled. So minus itw, then we have minus w squared. And if we squint a little bit, we can see that we have it squared here, minus itw, minus w squared. And if we put all those together, uh, we see that we are left with the sum of the Hermit functions of w, times e to the minus t squared, i oh, sorry, times t to the n, pull the n factorial, because we match exactly that formula up there. Now, how does this get us what we want? Well, let's make a little bit of space here, and so I could keep talking about e's. And so if I erase this, we have just taken the Fourier transform of this function with a g of x t times e to the minus x squared over two. And now what that gives us under some dominate convergence argument is the Fourier transform of our Hermy functions, h and x times t to the n over n factorial. But we also showed that this boils down to this. Could the sum n equals zero to infinity, h n, or oh, I should put i t to the n here. My bad. I'm sorry. Uh, what we have is we have hn of x times i to the n, t to the n over n factored. And so what this is, what this tells us, if we compare each of the t terms, this tells us that the Fourier transform of hn of x of w i uh, is equal to i to the n times hn of w. And there we go. All right. So what we have then is we go from having t squared here, we notice that t squared is just minus i t squared. So we replace that there. And now this is exactly the form of our generating function out there. We have our generating function just with i t to the n, and here instead of x, we have w, which is really nice. So then what actually happened here is we took the Fourier transform of our generating function, of our Hermit functions. If we expand this out, and after a dominated convergence argument, uh, we can move the Fourier transform onto the inside. And so we have the Fourier transform of hn of x times t to the n over n factorial. And so there you say, okay, well then what does that get us? Well, if we follow the other direction, we get uh, this after all the things that we just showed down to here, is that we have the sum n equals zero to infinity of the Hermit functions at omega times i to the n times t to the n over n factorial, 
Now this, if we equate the left and the right hand signs, uh, we end up getting this, which shows the eigenfunctional relationship of the Fourier transform and these Hermit functions. Now on this channel yet so far, we have not yet shown that the Hermit functions form an orthonormal basis for L2. We've shown that they form an orthonormal set. Uh, that's actually going to take some uh, more work and things like that. It would probably take about an hour of, or so. So it might be more suited for a live stream. So I'll do that uh, probably in a couple of weeks. But here, after this, let's go ahead and see how this can immediately get us the Planchot theorem for the Fourier transform over L2 functions, which I think is pretty. <sighs> okay. So we see that the Hermit functions are now an eigenfunctions for the Fourier transform. And since we already knew that the Hermit functions were an orthonormal basis for L2, or at least when you normalize them, so this gives us a Fourier transform for L2, where basically we first get an expansion of an L2 function in terms of its Hermit function basis. And then we apply the Fourier transform individually to the Hermit functions, and then ta-da, they spit out their coefficients, and that is our Fourier transform. Now these coefficients are all norm 1, so if we take the norm of this Fourier transform of this L2 function, well, all those coefficients just end up disappearing. And so then we see that we get the Plancherel theorem following immediately from this definition, which is pretty cool. So we started with this problem of how to define a Fourier transform on L2. But after we found out the Hermit functions form an eigenbasis for the Fourier transform, we could immediately leverage the fact to define a Fourier transform and also to obtain the Plancherel theorem all in one swoop. I always thought this approach to the Fourier transform was pretty cool. Now, in the literature, people will still write the integral definition of L2 functions, but we understand that to be some of an abusive notation. It's something that's not technically true, but a useful analog for what we're actually talking about. Now that we have the Fourier transforms of L2 functions, we can talk about important theorems such as the shannon nyquist theorem for band-limited functions, and we can also talk about the radial basis functions and the resulting kernel functions from that, which is where my personal research lies, and that's kind of where I'm trying to take this series. So please subscribe and ring the bell if you want to get notified when I put those videos up. And thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.